Have you ever wondered why giving feedback is so awful and what we can do about that? That's what we'll talk about today. We will all need people who will give us feedback. That's how we improve. Bill Gates. I wonder if he means that. Like if you worked for him and you gave him feedback, would he look at it as a gift? Hmm. Another one, good one that I was thinking about saying was, feedback is the breakfast of champions. Ken Blanchard. All good quotes. Today we're going to talk about the book by M. Tamra Chandler and Laura Downing Grealish. Feedback and other dirty words, why we fear it, and how to fix it. This is an interesting topic. I've always been a person who likes feedback, but like everybody, I can grouse out it too. It's sometimes hard to get feedback, but I recognize that other people providing feedback is how you get better. The book talks about how a lot of organizations try to do a good job with feedback, And almost all of them aren't very good at it. A lot of organizations look at feedback in this very traditional way. It's your performance review time. We're going to give you some feedback. Maybe we'll give you some goals. And then that'll be the end of your year. And for the most part, the feedback's not very good. It doesn't help you get to your next step and sometimes can feel quite condemning. Primarily because I think a lot of organizations try to give people an average raise. So the feedback is really more to justify why I'm giving you this raise, which may or may not be any good. And even in some companies, they will only be allowed to give good promotions and raises to X many people. So the rest of you have to get subpar raises, and that means subpar feedback. I'm going to say, well, Jill, you wore purple one too many times. I had a guy tell me once, your laugh makes most people cringe and it hurts your ability to get promoted. My laugh? Oh, no. Not good feedback. It's not based on strengths. It's not based on growing a person. It's not based on growth at all. It's more of this manager frame that we're trying to push at someone. And to be honest, a lot of managers that I've met in my life don't have time to really think about what that person needs to see. Or they say, you know what? You're doing a great job. You don't have to fix a thing. Well, clearly there must be something I have to fix. I'm not a perfect human being. And so in the end, we're terrible at feedback. Our managers can be terrible at feedback. We never got trained at it. We feel like we are not very good at it, so we don't like doing it. And the culture of our work, our organization, doesn't really support it. And by supporting, it means it may want perfect people. I worked for a company that just demanded everyone be perfect. And if you weren't perfect, like I said, the owner was a hammer and everyone in the company was a nail. Maybe the feedback makes us feel worse or the culture doesn't support it. So someone comes to me and says, Jill, you're doing a great job. We feel like you have to do a little bit better job on time management. And then you're really ready to go to that next level in your job. And then you never get the next level in the job because the company itself doesn't support me going to the next level or the culture doesn't support giving me the runway so that I could get better at my time management. Instead, it's just going to bury me and prove what a terrible time manager I am. Other people we are worried about will weaponize against us. If they're going for a promotion, we want to say they'll take that feedback. They'll take our strengths and weaknesses and use it to get a promotion or get something we want to get, or maybe we're not even trying to get it, but they're trying to prevent us from getting there. So in every form of feedback, it's at worst demoralizing, two, useless, three, not thought out, four, can be used against us. We don't feel safe at work. And if we're going to create a system that has great feedback, we're going to have to tame those four things. Book says the first part is that we have to put fear in the rearview mirror. We have to get people away from being afraid if they got significant feedback. And we have to stop giving feedback as a problem. And you've seen that in companies. A lot of times, if you're a really good worker, you'll never hear anything. You won't hear good stuff. You won't hear bad stuff. Once in a while, you'll get a, great job, Jill. Keep doing what you're doing. 
but you never get any feedback. And so then it becomes this issue that if someone says, hey, Joe, can I talk to you in my office for a minute? Oh, gosh, what did I do? Now it's depressing. It's fearful because now we know we're about to get feedback and it's not going to be good. The other side of it, too, is people who are the subject of the feedback can get mad. They might slam and walk out. So now the person giving the feedback is horrified. Or maybe the book says they'll just sit there and just simply shut down, not say a word, not look you in the eye, not do anything. So how can we get away from feedback being negative? And the book says that basically no one's going to open up to anyone else when you feel like you're going to get, quote, poked in the eye. So we spend our entire work careers figuring out Feedback is terrible, and you don't want to get it. Try to do whatever you possibly can to avoid feedback. Even when we're young, he says it happened too. Teachers call you in. Other kids say something to you, and that whole idea of feedback becomes a negative one. So it gets worse and worse and worse, and the work world doesn't make it feel any better. They say it feels even ominous. And the annual review tells us that feedback is something that is hidden. It's done behind closed doors. We're going to hand you this document. Probably shouldn't show it to anyone. You're going to quietly sign it, return it to me, and you just hope it goes for the best. I used to have people in my company come to me because our review system was kind of terrible. And it only gave people very limited scores. Let's imagine a five-point scale. So when you get a three on your performance review to anyone who's an achiever or someone who's been at the upper echelon of the work or the school world, to you, that means you got a C, standard. You did the necessary things to do. So people would come to me and say, you know, I knocked myself out. I worked on this project. I worked on this. Why doesn't this company like me? Do you think I should go find another job? Because that three, you met your necessary requirements is disappointing to anyone who has higher goals in life. You feel terrible about it. And so then I'd have to calm people down. No, this is unfortunately just our system. Three is what everyone is going to get unless you're the superstar who knocks it out of the park. Then you might get something more. But in reality, you're just going to get a three. It's depressing, especially, like I said, if you are someone who did well in school, has done well in the work environment, and then you get a Yes, you met the necessary requirements of this year. So I worked within the company to come up with a new system. We told the director of HR that people were thinking of quitting just because of the blah performance review they got, because it told them that they were average. So we came up with an actual amazing system that we were really proud of that actually got away from number scores and instead talked about skills deficits in skills and pluses in skills, and then had a list of skills that you should achieve in this job. So not only did you walk away from your performance review saying, oh, these things were great, this wasn't so great, but here's where I go next. We were so proud of it. And then my company got bought and then that system went back to the five-point system. And even worse, we're about to go to the three-point system. So either you suck or you're the most amazing human being on the planet or you did okay, boo-boo. Ugh. I just can't begin to tell you how demoralizing that is to everybody. And so now that whole feedback system gets even worse. So then people feel like they are not engaged in their job. They feel like they're not getting the proper kudos for the things they did that were great, the proper help that they need for the things that, that weren't so great, and they don't even have a direction to go. You did fine, boo-boo. Just keep doing your job. Whew. So they said that their feedback method is to make it a good thing again, to make it a positive thing again, so that we know that it's the way we change and we get better. To start getting rid of the pain, to stop getting rid of the ominous feeling to it, the worry that goes around it. And so that's what this book is all about, giving good feedback. And so the feedback should not just be between the employer and the employee. It should be with the teller and the knower. And so in every organization, we're all going to switch places to be one of those things. And in order for this to work, we're going to focus on people developing instead of 
evaluating. That's the key part. We're going to start getting away from ineffective ways of making people feel subpar and start telling them what path they need to take to get better, what can lead them to success in this job or maybe success in the next job up. They said, quote, vitality is defined as a sense of being alive, passionate, and excited, while the learning is the growth that comes with gaining new knowledge and skills. That's what we want to feel on the job. We don't want to feel, well, I'm subpar or I'm average. We want to know that we're gaining skills, we're gaining advantages, we're becoming better. And the book also then tries to tell us not just how to give feedback, but how to ask for feedback. Boy, it's bad enough that you're going to give people feedback, but now you're going to go to someone and say, how do you think that went? And then they say that effective leaders show positive feedback and not just positive feedback in that was great, but positive feedback in meaning it was developing the people to be better at what they're doing. Positive doesn't just mean happy, it means effective. So we also have to get good at asking. In the end, they said that when we get feedback, it is supposed to be insights that will help us to grow, to thrive, to be better. We need to know what needs to be fixed. And we have to not feel like it's a threat, but feel like it's an opportunity to do something in a better way. They said, unfortunately, you know, we have three reactions usually to threats. And we learned that from, from the time we were living in the wild, fight, flight, or freeze. I have a pet bird, and you can see it all the time. He either decides he's just going to let me put my hand in the cage. Sometimes he's going to angle himself, and he's going to try to take out my hand if I put my hand in the cage. Or sometimes he just freezes and just pretends like, I'm not here. Don't look at me. And instead of getting those responses when we get feedback, means we're going to have to also give up that. We're going to have to know that we have other reactions to it. We can appreciate getting feedback without the fight, flight, or freeze. And in the book, they talk about Seattle and how it's a passive aggressive, Northwest nice. I live in the Midwest. We have Midwest nice. It's a little bit different, I found out, than Northwest nice. But a lot of times it's a passive aggressive, oh, you're fine. Or, you know, you hear about in the South where they say, oh, bless your heart. You know, you're getting something that sounds like a nice thing, but the person doesn't really mean it in the nicest, kindest way. And then when we feel we're being told something that's not true or just being Midwest nice or Southern nice, we lose our trust, the feedback just falls away, and we're done with it. It says if you get stressed out, some things that you can do are some breathing techniques to breathe in deep. Try to feel the sensation of breath in your lungs, warm, cold. You want to touch your ground, your feet to the ground so that you can feel it. Is it hard? Is it soft? Those types of grounding methods will help you just keep in the reality of the moment and not go to the fight, flight, or freeze moments. And we have to be aware, too, that when we're giving advice, things that are said in a more negative terms has a 20 times impact on us than things said in a positive term. So I'm doing a review with you and we're talking about this process and I say, well, you know what? You did such an amazing job on that project. It was so good. You know, I noticed a few spelling mistakes in the document, but overall, very good. As soon as that word, a <laughs> few spelling mistakes comes out, you're suddenly fixed on the negative. You can't get past it. And so we, as people who get feedback, have to stop doing that. We have to look at, Carol Dweck called it the fixed mindset, where we just believe in these fixed things. I did something bad, but instead go into a growth mindset. How can I use that to do better? You know, same thing for me. I've never been a very good writer. So what did I do? I looked for ways to be a better writer. I took a writing course. That helped a lot. I did that through the university extension. The cost of the course was low. My company actually paid for it, and I learned a lot of things. Now, as I told you in the past, I'm starting to use Grammarly to help me out now that they have an AI even more to help me write things in a better way. And so if you have a fixed mindset, you avoid things, you hear the negative, you feel threatened by everything you do. But when you go through the growth mindset, you look for challenges, you try to fix setbacks, you try to see past the problem you're having right now 
and make things even better. You're looking for inspiration and you're looking for success for other people. I think when you have that fixed mindset, you suddenly look at everyone as a competition, but a growth mindset says we can all do great together. And they say some ways you can get out of it is, we talked about this in that past podcast, the word yet. I can't do this. Yet. You don't know. You might try it and you might be great at it. There are things that I was pretty certain I'd be terrible at until I tried it. And then I found out I loved it. Public speaking was one of them. Or you can say, I've never been good at writing. Yet, there may be ways you can get better at it. So if you stop looking at the past and stop having this limited thought and start thinking about the possibilities of getting better, that's where you're going to start to improve. And they said that's an intentional switch to an improve mode instead of a failure mode. This is where they say we need a fresh start to get back to feedback. We have to take it back and make it something that's better, to make it something that is going to be useful to our companies, to our jobs, to ourselves. And they said that in the end, that feedback is a tool of communication grounded in trust And it's something that offers us insight to what we were doing and helps us move to something that's better. Instead, the past, the the feedback that we're going to throw out, is an ominous weapon that's going to be used to us that we're going to distrust, we're going to be suspicious about, and then probably we're going to ignore or just feel rotten about it. That's what we're giving up. This is about us going into the future with insights, constructive advice, and being good at self-reflection, that means you're going to take it seriously to figure out how you could do better. But that also means the teller of the advice has to tell it in such a way that it's not a punishment, it's not destructive, and they need to look at it as a way to help people do their best work. Everyone wants to do their best work in their job. And if you feel like you never are, or You have one of those bosses. I've had this before in the past, too. A boss that tells you, oh, you're doing great. That's amazing. Heck, I even had a doctor once when I said, you know, yeah, I know I'm overweight. I'm I'm trying to work on it. She goes, ah, you're fine. Okay, that is not positive feedback you want from your doctor. It sounds like you might want that, but you know it's not true. So this has to be grounded in reality. And then the book talks a little bit about how we have to distinguish positive feedback from recognition. When we recognize someone, they get an award, they get a performance bump, they get a promotion, you know, something like that. You're saying something did something wonderful. It was a great job, but it's not something that we can act on. It's not something meant to improve us. We're not really going to improve from recognition. We want recognition. It's an important part of the company, but it's not constructive. It's just meant to recognize us for something good. We want to say something that will be very human, that the person of the feedback looked for. We don't want to give unwanted feedback. We want to give feedback to someone who is seeking to grow and be a better person. And in the end, we have to remember to connect with people, which means building their trust and then just being kind about it. It Gives the Gottman five to one rule, that we need five positive things for every one interaction. And that the three areas of feedback are fairness, focused, and frequency. We want to have all those things whenever we give feedback. It's important that we do it. And in the end, they said, too, we have to look at our biases. You know, I'm someone who has an easygoing method with customers. When I see people who bark at customers, maybe not bark. See, there's my bias right there. Maybe are harsh with customers and and says something to a customer that just wasn't as nice as I would have said something to the customer. My bias is to say, oh, you need to be a lot kinder. But you know what? I know people who are very kind, but very direct. And so I have to get away from my bias that someone can only hear something if that something is said in the most kind, soft way possible. It's not true in my own bias that things have to be said the way I want them to be said. There are very wonderful people out there who give great advice, who are very direct, and say very few words. 
says at the end, we're hoping to just bring out that trust, humility, and showing someone else a perspective that maybe they're not seeing, giving them feedback so they know what kind of job they're doing. And there's a cute little chart in the book that basically says when feedback is never, it's not good. What we want to do is get regular feedback from just a few sources and make it in that positive, constructive way. If we feel like we're not getting what we're needing in feedback, we can ask questions. Can you tell me when you see me doing this? Or if I'm communicating in a way that is X, Y, and Z, could you point it out to me that day so I understand what it is I'm doing? Or can you share with me more details? When did you exactly notice what it was I was saying? Or can you explain to me how you think this has a bigger impact on other people? Like maybe my customer is not hearing me clearly because what I'm saying is not direct enough. You know, whatever it is, but ask good questions. A lot of podcasts I've done talk about asking good questions so that we understand what it is that person's saying. We have to understand that the person giving feedback has good intentions, as long as we believe they do. We want them to give us good examples. We want them to give things that we can act on, that we can think about our own growth. But it's also true that when we do these feedback sessions, it's important that we do it at the right time, in a good place, and we get feedback in the way we want to get feedback. Someone at my work started an interesting project. She was a project manager, and she started Feedback Friday, where the idea was on Friday, we would each give each other feedback. And I think it got off to a slow start. For a while, it started rolling in and started doing well. But unfortunately, what tainted the project is people felt that it was just a chance to do recognition. Hey, Bob, great job on your project. I thought you did a great job. No advice there on how to do better. But then when people did do constructive feedback, I think everyone felt uncomfortable about it. I think she's on the right target. I think she had the good idea of how we can give each other feedback and do a better job. I'm not sure she read the book, but she was right in line with what they're trying to do. We're trying to get that place where we do better in our lives, where we're looking at our future self who's doing something amazing because we got feedback. In the end, if you're feeling a little bit nervous about the feedback you're getting, make sure that you try to take it in, you stay neutral, ask for examples, and if you need a moment, maybe you're getting upset, but you know that they're doing it in the right way, just press pause, they said. You can ask, to, can we take this up again tomorrow? I need to think a little bit about what you've said. Go get a glass of water, Diet Coke, whatever it is you're drinking, and just take a breather. Sometimes you have to understand that a lot of information in a short period of time can also be overwhelming, even if it's all the good things. And then in the end, acknowledge what you heard. I understand that you're saying I'm not telling the customer what is going wrong. I've been told in the past that I was too friendly with customers in the sense that I never told them the hard messages. I worked really hard at getting better at telling people the hard truth. Well, I suppose they could do it that way if they want. Now, Jill, you know if they do it that way, they're going to be unhappy with the software. Yeah, you're right. And so I got better at that. But it was through feedback that I became the person who could say hard things. So my challenge to you is, can you think of a place where you could start having regular feedback? I put it in the work world. It can be in the home world, too, although you have to be really careful and, again, build that trust in that sense. But when you give feedback to your family members, maybe your children or a spouse or a coworker, is there a place where you can open up a trusting, beneficial growth mentality between you and other people so that you can help them grow, do better, and start improving their lives? But also, they are giving you feedback so then you could do the same. Think it over. Think of how feedback might be able to help you. You can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. You can also reach me on Twitter. I'd love to hear how feedback has helped or changed your life or maybe some difficulties you have with it. I'm always happy to hear from you. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast. And remember, 
Getting in a growth mindset so we can help each other do better starts with small steps. 